All right, so we're going to talk about um, ketamine uh, emergence and whether or not ketamine is contraindicated in those with psych disorders. Um, in true kind of um, American talk show fashion, I thought the best way to start this off is if you all look under your seat, you'll find a small bag containing some... No, we're not going to try it. <laughs> um, but, um, but <laughs> um, although that said, post... Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Some of you are quite eager for that. Um, so, um, yeah, so thank you. Thank you for the invitation to talk. Um, we'll, we'll kind of, we'll just go through it. I'm not sure that my presentation will be as long as Mao's, but um, we'll go through some of the kind of evidence and stuff behind it and then try and relate it to the pre-hospital environment. The evidence around kind of immersions and, you know, the use of ketamine for sedation in the pre-hospital space isn't um, that great. Um, but uh, but we can certainly kind of try and extrapolate the in-hospital stuff to, to to this work. So um, I mean, look, I there's a, a oh sorry, how do you um? I can't see the cursor. There we go. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right. So um, yeah. So ma made it kind of. Um, in the 70s, and I, I mean, famously, we all know that it was a horse tranquilizer. Then it was kind of in fashion, then it went out of fashion because of these concerns about intracranial pressure, and everyone was using it um, recreationally. But it's kind of well come back into into the fore um, in our time, um, and you know, it's got this fairly short kind of onset um, and offset, um, and there's some pharmac uh, pharmacodynamic stuff there, pharmacokinetic stuff there as well. Um, it can be, um, you know, I'd actually forgotten kind of just how kind of many different ways it can be used. Um, and, you know, indeed, uh, you know, the, the transdermal patch kind of completely escaped my mind. Um, but obviously, we're going to mostly be using it kind of intravenous or intramuscularly. Um, so, uh, again, a whole kind of range of um kind of re, uh, reasons why someone might be uh, using it. But again, ours is mostly going to be for that procedural sedation or for an anesthetic. So I thought we would just talk about um, kind of the emergence phenomenon, uh, specifically during procedural sedation. Um, kind of what are the risk factors? So how might you be able to predict it? How you could avoid it? And then if it does happen, um, what you can do to uh, get rid of it. And then we'll talk about whether or not, if someone's got a history of psychiatric disorders, whether or not you should think twice about using ketamine for procedural sedation. Um, so show of hands, has any, so in the in-hospital environment, has anyone kind of had like a, a notable emergence phenomenon in someone in whom you've been doing procedural ketamine sedation? So, so like small audience, but no one kind of, oh, I got Angus, yeah. So I, I, when you when when you say notable, kind of how how notable was it, and, and what what did you observe? Um, it was actually not emergence as such. It was uh, it was in South Africa. There was a large um, uh, South African lady who I didn't probably fully explain what I was about to do. I gave her a big slug of ketamine, and she just started just just speaking to God. And just saying, oh my God, and uh, what's happening? And please don't do this to me. And all, this. and it was just, it was, it wasn't, wasn't what I was aiming for. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that that wasn't. Thank you. For, wasn't that wasn't emergent. that wasn't planted. But you you bring up an interesting point there about kind of avoidance that we'll come back to. So in hospital, kind of from the audience here, not too much. Out of hospital, anyone had like heaps of emergence that has been really bothersome. No, so it's like I, I certainly have had it once in hospital and the patient seemed to kind of get better fairly quickly, but I've never had it um, out of hospital, albeit in the four months that I've been here. So yeah, I think some of the um, issues that paramedics were running to <clears throat> when they first rolled out ketamine, they gave us pretty large doses. So mm. two milligrams per kilo for an IM dose and um, maybe half a milligram per kilo, I can't remember, IV, and um, there was some adverse uh, events, um, so they pretty quickly halve the doses that ICPs would give. So one of the problems that we run into quite regularly um, when ICPs give you on road, not so much emergence phenomenon, but just you're giving a sub therapeutic dose. So it's a bit like an emergence phenomenon, but you have you haven't given enough. Mm. And they're in this kind of twilight zone, and um, it's kind of like you know it's, it's not the K-hole, the A-hole, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like it's this 
they get agitated, they get really like tense, and um, there's a lot of screaming going on. Mm, this, is, this is the patient, not the, not the paramedic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A bit of both. Bit of both. Yeah, yeah, okay. Like, yeah, particularly yeah. So I suppose like that emergence phenomenon slash that sub therapeutic yeah. zone they get in most ICPs probably would have dealt with on the road. Yeah. And are you giving that as a push or as a kind of slower most, kind of push or infusion? Most people would have given kind of a, um, a small bolus doses over a short period. Yeah, because again, not not planted, but you, you raise some points that we'll come back to about the dosage and the way you give it and, you know, how, you, you know, um, maybe kind of that halfway house is, is is actually counterproductive despite it being done with a view to kind of a safe dosing. Yeah. Um, so... Kind of not particularly common then from kind of from what we've described here, but noting your examples that we'll, we'll come back to. So the kind of definition of emergence phenomenon is, is, is like when you search the literature, it really is pretty kind of open ended. Um, and it ranges from having some, um, you know, mild delirium and some kind of sense of euphoria to having this real kind of um, depersonalization and um, you know severe memory disruption and so the literature doesn't do a great job at defining exactly what is meant by this um, and indeed when you look back the early studies into this kind of in the 70s <clears throat> when ketamine was being um, produced and used in that kind of first peak said that the incidence of emergence phenomenon could be as high as 55 percent which is like fairly fairly high, really. Um, <clears throat> and the original literature um, states that the risk factors for, for the same are um, being an adult, being a bloke, um, giving a high dose quickly, um, and then a high stimulus environment or the presence of other things which are going to cause the patient some bother. Um, so those risk factors probably like, haven't kind of changed too much, but it's interesting that it does tie into particularly your story um, uh, anger, so that kind of high high stimulus environment, maybe when there wasn't that kind of calm ease into the um, ease into the procedure. So, trying to find some studies and like high quality evidence of, of recent times, um, this was the best one I could find. So, Ruben um, Strayer of um, EM Cases fame did this systematic review in um, 2007. Um, <clears throat> He and the team searched PubMed, Embase, Toxnet, uh, the Cochrane Library. They also searched, you know, um, kind of the Australian <clears throat> like adverse events registry and the equivalent um, around the world. Um, they searched in uh, English, Spanish, Russian, French, Portuguese, German. Um, I haven't included the search terms, but it was fairly comprehensive. Um, and they equally um, spoke to uh, the authors of some studies which were kind of yet to be published um, and some experts um, in the area as well. Um, and they found, um, you know, a good kind of few, um, uh, kind of just shy of a kind of a thousand studies that, that were included. Um, and those which met their search criteria um, were 87. Um, the search criteria Kind of included a dose of between one to two milligrams per kilogram of ketamine for procedural sedation um, in adults. Um, now, of the 87 studies which were included, um, though, those studies included adverse events as up to 76%. But again, that kind of the definition of those was fairly open. Um, and when you nail it down to patient centered outcomes, so outcomes actually bothered the patient or left them with, you know, a kind of lasting effect of some description, it was probably um, only as high as 20%. Um, now, the study, I, this, this systematic review, I'll say, doesn't necessarily focus on what we're talking about today. It was more about, you know, living spasm and hypoxia and um, effect on blood pressure. But it does include um, a good section on, on emergence. And uh, for that reason, I thought it was the best one to, um, to base this talk on. Um, for what it's worth, um, it, it equally, uh, um, I think, has you know paved the way for why we use ketamine so much now. Um, I will say is that at this point that it it kind of does start to think about um, ways in which it can be emergence can be prevented um, and treated, um, and it makes the point very 
kind of early on that um, non-pharmacological methods are just as effective in the prevention of emergence as, um, as using um, a secondary uh, drug. So I've, I've picked just kind of one study which has kind of highlighted the, the point that the, the review makes, which is um, kind of how to avoid emergence if, if you think you need to. Um, so they advocate for kind of pre-dissociation benzos. So a, 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 a dose of midazolam, um, and this seemed to be the highest quality um, a study that was included in the review. It was prospective, 70 patients, and of those, 99% um, did not report any um, uh, any emergence-like phenomenon. They note that two patients did require a BVM, whether that was because of the medaz or the ketamine or just, you know, by virtue of the procedure itself. Um, they, they also... Um, suggested, uh, a second study, excuse me, suggested that you could probably use not up to 0.07 milligrams per kilogram, which the first one uh, recommended. Um, and that second study showed that um, actually, um, you know, it was, uh, uh, you could give kind of the, the benzo pre-ketamine or post-ketamine. So, you know, pre-dissociation or pre-emergence. Um, and it, you know, they were both kind of comparable. Um, whilst the review didn't necessarily didn't kind of focus on children, I did kind of read around a little bit, and this seemed to be the best um, kind of high quality study, which um, interestingly showed that the use of ketamine um, with midazolam um, in children did not alter um, the uh, presence of emergence, um, and that seemed to be a fairly um, high quality uh, study there. So therefore. Kind of adults, yes, it you know, metazolam pre ketamine or post ketamine does seem to reduce emergence in children, uh, not so much. Um, now, kind of coming back to the points that have been made so far, so infusion versus push is, is often talked about in hospital for procedural sedation. So, um, this uh, study demonstrated that there was a kind of statistically significant. Um, decrease in the um, prevalence of emergence if you gave a, 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 a kind of a slow infusion. Um, I can't quite remember how slow that infusion was, um, but uh, you know it did seem to be um, more bene um, uh, better at reducing emergence than if you were to give a push. Now, throughout all of this, like I said at the start, we can think about how relevant this is to the pre-hospital world when we don't necessarily have time um, and or and or equipment and or people to arrange a slow infusion. Um, but, you know, it's just something to kind of think about um, based, based on this literature. Um, that said, um, there is a kind of resounding um, argument throughout all the studies that I looked at that says that the best avoidance strategy is actually to do non-pharmacological um, uh, uh, strategies. So similar to what Angus alluded to, giving the patient a clear explanation in a quiet, as pain-free as we can environment, minimizing distractions, maybe playing some music, maybe speaking to them nicely. Again, how relevant this is to us, we can think about that. Um, if anyone plays the violin on the helicopter, there we go. So not, not, a, not as left field as we might have thought, right? Um, but maybe just kind of taking that moment of pause to really explain what you're going to do, to explain what the patient might experience, what's normal, what's not normal, that everyone's going to be with them, that we're going to keep an eye on you. All of that is probably just as, if not more effective at avoiding emergence um, than adding in an additional benzo. <clears throat> As for what to do if um, if you, if you find it, um, it's it's pretty short lived, um, and uh, the studies that I've read show that it's usually not of uh, clinical consequence. Um, and you know, that said, if you can't ride it out and is causing the patient or the environment like heaps of bother, then again, a small dose of benzos. Um, is 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 uh, is usually effective at treating it if it's there. Um, but I'm just conscious of time. So, other thing I was asked to, to talk about was whether or not if someone has a, a mental health history 
um, specifically, um, uh, well, no, a mental health history, uh, whether we should kind of steer away from using ketamine for sedation because, you know, can it make it worse? PTSD, schizophrenia, that kind of thing. Um, it was quite, it's quite hard to find high quality evidence of this, I think, because, you know, um, probably ethically it's hard to, to, to get through a study where you're, um, you know, deliberately or otherwise giving a patient with, you know, mental health history ketamine. But that said, there are a few studies, they're all from the US, um, and that, you know, that despite there only being a small number of patients in each one, they're fairly high quality evidence. Um, so of these kind of from the 90s, early 2000s, um, from the US, these were patients with, um, with or without schizophrenia. Um, and the patients were given um, a small dose um, of either bolus or infusion of ketamine and then acted as their own control. So subjectively said whether or not they felt their, um, their you know, either symptoms that they um, imagined were like schizophrenic symptoms or actual symptoms they've experienced with schizophrenia before um, uh, existed. Um, and kind of resoundly speaking, patients said that um, they did have this heightened sense of, uh, of disorganized thought or schizophrenic-like symptoms, but then they all returned to their baseline um, within a few hours. So um, on that basis, it does not appear to have any um, uh, long-lasting effects. What those effects are kind of in those few hours um, is, you know, something just to think about and maybe to have some benzos in your back pocket, but it doesn't give any lasting um, effects. Um, this seemed to be the most, uh, this, this study was from, um, it's from the kind of 2010, I think, from uh, the US again, which seemed to be, um, uh, well, you know, I included just because it was more recent and again, slightly kind of higher evidence. And that also said that um, patients might have had some worsening of their symptoms, but they returned to their baseline. Um, and then there was a review, again, small number of patients, but demonstrated that there was no exacerbation um, of, their, uh, of their active and the psychiatric illness. Again, these seem to all be schizophrenic patients as opposed to those with, you know, PTSD or anxiety, but they seem to be the highest quality evidence um, that I could find. So um, I'm conscious that kind of um, into, into morning tea, but in summary, um, I don't reckon there's much um, evidence to avoid ketamine um, for fear of damaging long lasting um, um, emergence phenomenon. Um, you could consider um, uh, a, a, a small dose of benzos pre-ketamine or post-ketamine, but um, maybe just taking that time to, if you can, just explain to the patient exactly what's going on, try and minimize all of that distraction around. That's probably going to be safer than adding in an, an additional um, sedative. Um, and if you can, a slow push as opposed to a rapid um, uh, push even better, a slow infusion. Um, don't avoid it in those with a previous um, mental health history. So I don't think it lives, gives any lasting effects, but um, just consider whether or not um, their symptoms during that emergence period um, might require um, an additional medication. Uh, these are some references if you're interested. Um, and this is a patient of apparently, this is a picture of apparently someone um, who's uh, high dressed as a horse, which is funny on multiple levels, if you think about it. Thank you so much. <laughs> <clears throat>